Hey everybody, welcome. Good morning. So I expect some more people to come in, but um, uh, very lucky today to have Dr. Um, Mark Hughes here, who's a co-director of the Mount Sinai Epilepsy Program. Um, so Dr. Mark Hughes uh, joined the faculty here in 2009, did her um, undergraduate degree um, at uh, Cornell, and is, uh, uh, went to medical school at Albert Einstein. She completed her residency and fellowship um, at NYU. Um, she's a board certified neurology and neuropsychology um, and is has avidly taken on learning the piano in the last couple of years and loves gardening. So we're very lucky to have her here today to talk to us about epilepsy. Happy to be here. What did you say? No, gardening in New York. Oh yeah, Brooklyn, Brooklyn. Flatbush. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm completely obsessed. Uh, okay, so it's great to be here. I'm a um, big believer in primary care and the importance of the work of primary care doctors. And I hope that as um, you know, I give this lecture and we continue to work together, that we can really support each other in taking care of um, our patients. So the topic of today's lecture is seizures and epilepsy. And my hope is that you don't remember anything from your clerkship because all the words have changed, all the nomenclature has changed. Some of the concepts are probably the same. Um, I don't have anything to disclose. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the definition of seizures and epilepsy. We were going to look at a lot of videos, but maybe now we're going to look at one because they're not really running that well. And then we're going to do a few um, cases. We're going to talk about what to do after someone has a first seizure. We're going to talk a little bit about medications and medication interactions. We're going to talk a little bit about women in epilepsy. And we're going to talk a little bit about what do we do when somebody's still seizing, even though they're on a lot of medications. So let us begin. So what is the definition of a seizure? Uh, it is a, uh, the word derives from the Greek meaning to seize or to take hold of because it's as if somebody is taking hold of your brain. You can no longer control your brain or your body. And it is the transient occurrence of signs and or symptoms due to abnormal, excessive, or synchronous neuronal activity in the brain. And a seizure can affect um, your body. So you can fall down and you can shake all over and bite your tongue. But also it can affect um, your perception. So you can have a hallucination during a seizure. You can have an emotional feeling during a seizure. Um, you can hear something during a seizure. You can think something different during a seizure. And the more you do it, sort of the trickier it becomes. One of the things that distinguishes seizures a little bit or helps us to differentiate them from just normal experience is their, or other types of pathological experience is their brevity. So if I have an experience that's a seizure, such as deja vu, it's going to be very, very brief, and it's going to be pretty intense. I'll talk more about that. Epilepsy is different than seizures. So um, there's you all probably have in your head that the definition of epilepsy means two seizures that are not provoked. That is still somewhat true. Um, but if you have one seizure and the, the probability of another seizure is greater than 60%, then you have epilepsy. So for what situation might this be true? If I have a traumatic brain injury, like a serious traumatic brain injury, and I have a single seizure two years after that traumatic brain injury, the chance of, of me having a second seizure is really, really high. So I don't need to have that second seizure. I already have epilepsy. Or if I'm a kid and I have a single seizure and you do my EEG and it shows benign Rolandic central temporal spikes, I have epilepsy. You don't need to wait for that second seizure to make the diagnosis. The word provoked is very complicated and weird because really essentially every seizure is provoked by something. But what we're talking about in these definitions is acute metabolic disturbances. So who here thinks that if I go out drinking and sleep an hour and then really have to get to brunch with my parents so I drink two Red Bulls and have a coffee, is that a provoked seizure? Raise your hand if you think it's provoked. It's not. <laughs> gotcha. Yes. So early in the talk. Um, so it is provoked in the normal way that we use the word provoked. But in terms of this definition, that's not considered provoked. There's a paper on what we consider a symptomatic seizure. And the you know it's not a glucose of 55. It's a glucose of 30. It's not a sodium of 133. It's a sodium of like 120. So there are criteria for what we consider provoked. And that person who has a seizure because they're tired and stressed out, probably has gen spike and wave on their EEG because that type of epilepsy, idiopathic generalized epilepsy, is super sensitive to lifestyle. Um, so, and you know, people that have epilepsy, 
it is getting provoked by something. Maybe it's a structural problem. Maybe it's a difference in the balance of excitation and inhibition of the brain. But in this definition, provoked means either an acute metabolic problem or a very recent structural problem. So if you come and rush the stage and hit me in the head and I have a seizure right now, that's provoked. If in two weeks I start having seizures because you rush the stage and hit me in the head, that's unprovoked according to this definition. Is that clear or is that unclear? Is that confusing? It's kind of confusing. Okay, you can email me later. <clears throat> okay, so basically if you have a single seizure, the chance of another seizure is about 30%, a little bit more within you know, five years. Um, and if you have a second seizure, the chance of the third is virtually guaranteed. So this is where it comes from that we don't treat after that first seizure because the chance is, uh, you know, 35%, uh, whereas after the second seizure, it's virtually guaranteed. And of course, this is talking about, you know, unprovoked seizures. This isn't about the person who's over-injecting their insulin. Um, if you're seizure free for a few years, then the relapse risk is relatively low. So we tend to stop medicine after two years in some cases. Now, you may have all of these words in your head, like simple partial or complex partial, or maybe you don't have them in your head, I don't know. But um, there is different nomenclature. So there's a big tree in epilepsy. So there's people whose um, seizures are starting from one part of the brain, and that's focal onset. And then there's seizures that are starting everywhere in the brain at once, and that's a generalized onset. So there's three types of seizures that are really common in generalized onset. Um, one is this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna mimic it since we're lo low on video. And then you're going to tell me what kind of seizure I'm having. This is the first type of generalized onset seizure. That's absence. Okay, just a little bit of blinking, a little bit of behavioral interruption. Lasts for seconds, and then I'm back giving a lecture as if nothing ever happened. And I am often not aware that it happened. And if I'm biking, I'm fine. I'm biking. It's okay. I can continue automatic motor stuff. Playing my games, I might lose some points but I can, my thumbs can keep going. Um, Absan seizures start in childhood. This is the second type of very common generalized seizure. What is that? Myoclonic, myoclonic seizure. And it's a generalized seizure, but what's interesting is it's not, it can be this, but it can often be this. So it can often just be one hand, but when you look at the brain, it's both sides at once. And it will be, if it's a generalized seizure, truly, it will might be the right hand and then a little bit later the left hand. It will, it will kind of go back and forth. But it can be just one part of the body. And then the third type of generalized seizure that's um, the, the common one is this and then shaking all over. So that's a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. And then focal seizures, there's a ton of different types of focal seizures and how they... Um, what, what happens to you depends on what type, type part of the brain that they're coming from. So when someone tells me that they're getting deja vu and then they feel sick in their stomach and then they feel very confused, I know that that's coming from the hippocampus, so the mesial temporal lobe. Um, one of the first things we try to figure out is if someone's aware. If they're aware during the entire episode from beginning to end, then it's focal aware. If they're aware for most of it and get a little fuzzy at the end, it's focal impaired awareness. Um, and we no longer say secondarily generalized. So you can start with deja vu. So I can start with deja vu, and then I can get a little um, confused, maybe start doing some picking. That's focal impaired awareness. And then I can have tonic extension and shake all over. We used to call that secondary generalization, but in the new nomenclature, it's focal to bilateral tonic clonic, which is just, you know, it's just the way it is. <clears throat> so look, I'm going to give this one last chance. All right, so I'm going to show you a typical seizure. So this man is a truck driver, and he was doing some weird things, and his wife brought him in. And he was always totally amnestic for this. He, and this is something that the nervous system often does. It just doesn't know that something weird happened. It will erase it. So this is the beginning of the seizure. Can you see he's having perioral movements? His wife is pressing the button. He is attending to the examiner, so he's alert. His eyes are open. Eyes are usually open in seizures. 
His hand is up. His face is getting very shiny because his autonomic nervous system is involved and he's sweating profusely. And now his hand is beginning to have automatisms. This is a temporal lobe seizure. Automatisms, weird automatic movements are usually on the same side as the seizure focus. The exam, the, my resident is coming in. He's, he, again, he's still attending to her. We, she's asking him to remember a color because it may just be that he can't talk and it may be that he's not really present. So we ask somebody to remember something and he doesn't actually remember it. And then this semi-purposeful movements of the bed sheets, kind of picking and pulling, very common in seizures. And now he, he, he said purple. That also helps me know what side of the brain it's on. So this is gonna be his non-dominant side. This isn't gonna be where language is. So this is the right side of his brain. And so he repeats it a couple of times. And then when the seizure's over and he's asked, did I, did I tell you a color? No. And he didn't, even after this, he didn't know that he'd had one. And then when he came back for follow-up, I showed him this video and he was like crying. He could not believe it. Okay. I'm going to show you one more, and then we're going to go back to the lecture. So this is a young man I've taken care of for years with multiple, um, he, he has a autoimmune disorder and he has multiple endocrinopathies and his sister also has multiple endocrinopathies and he also has um, epilepsy. And he has about, um, I'd say 10 seizures a week. He's really hard to control, He's like a lovely kid. So his eyes are open. He's beginning to have some unusual movements. Very hypermotor. So this kind of seizure is from the frontal lobes. You can imagine the number of times this sweet soul's needed stitches. You know, good not to try, not to restrain him, just try to keep the objects out of the way. What's interesting about these seizures, this is a frontal lobe seizure. In general, if you're moving both sides of your body, you're going to have impaired awareness. Um, so when somebody is like in, the, when you go down to see someone in the ER and they're moving both sides of their body and then they pause a little and then they talk to you and then they move both sides of their body, that's going to be a psychogenic event. The, the exception is these frontal lobe seizures, and the way you tell them apart from psychogenic is they are weirder than anything you've ever seen, and they're brief. And the, the second time you see it, it looks exactly like the first. So they're brief and they're stereotyped. So we had one like that was presented at the American Epilepsy Society where the guy was going, I'm a banana, I'm a banana, I'm a banana. And of course, that was the seizure. And everybody else was having things like, like this, and that was a, happened to be psychogenic. And so they're very, very strange. Like 15 to 20 seconds. Yep. The, he actually does lose awareness in these. And, but those, they can, they can actually be focal aware, and you come back, and you're quite with it. Okay. Yeah, so if you have a focal aware seizure, there's not nearly, there's really not much postictal state. Um, Focal impaired awareness and generalized tonic-clonic convulsions are going to be much more confused or, like, frankly, psychotic. And sometimes I only know that somebody's had a seizure because they'll have a subclinical seizure in sleep and they'll wake up paranoid, um, wake up thinking that their parents are out to get them. And, and 
from monitoring, and we now know that that's because they've had their seizure. But the post state is really important to pay attention to. If someone gets psychotic once, they're going to get psychotic every time. So it's like you have a seizure, take a dose of Seroquel or Haldol or Geodon. Okay. Um, a 26-year-old man who comes to take care of you for hypothyroidism comes to see you for follow-up. He reports that he had four drinks on Saturday and had to get up early on Sunday. He then had a witness seizure on the subway platform. He was taking, he was taken, taken to the Mount Sinai Hospital emergency room and a workup was negative. And you tell him that he's fine. The risk of a second seizure is low. You put him on Keppra. You tell him that he can drive. There's only one seizure. You tell him he can't drive and needs more tests to decide if he needs medication. D, right. I gave you guys easy ones because I didn't have that thing. If I, we had that thing, I'd have been more like, I'm going to get them. Um, yes, it is D. So um, New York state law and driving and epilepsy, uh, you need a one-year seizure-free period. It is one year. Um, if you think he's, the person is safe to drive, like let's say they had just missed their medicines or something and they had a seizure because they were traveling in Europe or something, um, you can write a note and the DMV will often grant that. It is the, your patient's responsibility to tell the Department of Motor Vehicles. It is your responsibility to tell your patients to tell the Department of Motor Vehicles. We are not mandate reporters in New York State, which is like, thank, thank God for that, because then our patients don't tell you anything. Um, for you, when you get, get that patient with the first seizure, um, it is really good to ask, just assess for undiagnosed seizures. I can't, every single week someone comes in with the first seizures, but it's their first bilateral tonic-clonic seizure. And very often they've been having tons of seizures and they've just woven whatever that experience is into the fabric of their life. So people will often be having deja vu and feeling a little confused after. This is like so common in my practice. And then they finally have the generalized tonic-clonic seizure that announces that those smaller events were in fact epilepsy. Very intense fear can be a seizure that's coming from the amygdala. It's different than a panic attack because panic attacks, first of all, both can come out of the blue. You don't need to be like about to talk to your in-laws about, you know, what a jerk their son is or whatever. You, you, it can come out of the blue. But panic attacks are more like 20 minutes and seizures are more on the order of a minute. Mm -hmm. You know, well, my experience is there's more specificity to the deja vu of people with epilepsy. It's more like I have this like very strong feeling that I'm looking at myself as a child and I'm feeling that my grandmother's behind my back and uh, it feels very powerful and then it goes away um, and I smell cookies. You get that too, right? I'm like, no, <laughs> I don't get that. Mm -mm. No. Yeah, oh, but sometimes there is sometimes there's form frust in somebody with epilepsy where they can have things that feel fairly ordinary. But a lot of times people are having an experience that's very specific and intense. Oh, or there can be a sense of depersonalization, like one woman I take care of very much feels like she has to look at the light on the ceiling and that she's actually like kind of on the ceiling looking down at herself. So they can be, the seizure auras tend to be quite specific. It tends to be the same every time, yes, yes. Um, and sometimes, some people have seizures that are stimulated by the environment. So the most common thing is strobe lights can make people feel fuzzy or lights in a car flashing by can cause an absence seizure. But you can get people with epilepsy. I have a person who has seizures to a particular line of a Whitney Houston song. I have a person with electric toothbrush seizures. Um, <laughs> I have somebody that has a seizure with when they pray with one with a passage of the Torah that is read on Yom Kippur, and I was like, I don't think so. But then we brought him into the EMU, and he goes through it, and he gets his myoclonic jerks of his of his chin. So there's a lot. I mean, seizures are quite quite fascinating. So you want to the basics are deja vu, intense anxiety or euphoria, auditory hallucination, or episodes of lost time, kind of finding yourself someplace and not knowing where you got there. For generalized onset, you want to ask people, your, your adolescence with juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, first of all, that will stick with your patients for life. Um, you want to ask if they're clumsy in the morning. The myoclonic jerks tend to happen in the morning, and those kids are just kind of like they're just dropping their pen. You know, they're just flinging their orange juice, and there's, they can't be um, like woken up in the morning because they're so spacey, and they can be in this kind of stupor with little absence seizures and jerks. And so you want to ask about that. Does anyone take care of an adolescent? Like I have, I have some adolescents. 
that are mine. And they're like that, like they're so, there's, my son's so spacey in the morning, but he doesn't have epilepsy. So I can see how sometimes these things do fall under the radar. And then if you want to assess for um, un, undiagnosed vocal to bilateral tonic-clonic or bilateral tonic or generalized tonic-clonic, you can ask if they're waking up with ever with blood on the pillow or their tongue bitten or the room just in total disarray. Okay, a 54-year-old woman comes with epilepsy and diabetes and recurrent yeast infections comes to see you. You've been treating her with gluconazole for three weeks. She's nauseated and having double vision since yesterday. It's pretty much constant. Walking to your exam room, your, her gait is unstable. You send her to the lab for stat drug levels. <clears throat> you test a urine toxicology. You send her for an evaluation for an acute stro stroke. You suspect benign positional vertigo. You do a Dix Hall pike maneuver in the office. Who wants A? Who wants B? C? What, B? C. C. Um, yeah, I mean, that's always so worrisome. D? Okay, so A is the right answer. So um, fluconazole is a, a P450 inhibitor, and if you're on certain medicines like um, carbamazepine or phenytoin, it can raise the level of that medicine. And then any sodium channel blocker causes um, double vision and ataxia if the level is too high. So this is something that I see in my practice all the time that people come in nauseated with double vision. Um, you have some, I think that uh, uh, what I would want to know is how quick the onset was to rule out C. If it's just kind of creeping up and a little worse in the morning after she takes her medicines, I would be so fine not doing an acute stroke consult or sending them for MRI, but if it hit like a ton of bricks, then you still want to send it for an MRI. This isn't um, benign positional vertigo, because that lasts for two minutes in general, and it's not a constant feeling. Benign positional vertigo due to those crystals in your inner ear. But do you guys know how to do the Dix Hall Pike maneuver? Because it is like one of the most satisfying things to do the Dix Hall Pike and then the Epley, and then like you fix somebody. Um, I, love, I, I love the Dix Hall Pike. Um, so it's something to be really aware of with your patients that are on epilepsy medicines. They can have a lot of interactions with your other medicines. There are medicines that are less likely to interact. I'm just going to go through, there is no guide. So I looked up, I was trying to find a good guideline for you for when to do blood levels, how to deal with medications, and it actually hasn't been written yet. So one of you should write that because that would be really helpful. And there's no guideline for the epilepsy community for medication. So I'm going to talk to you, um, I'm going to say like one word about 20 medicines, and um, hopefully it won't be too, too terribly boring. Brevaracetam is a sister medicine to levetiracetam, which is Keppra. It has a higher affinity for the SV2 receptor. It's pretty new. Carbamazepine, you do need to monitor for this one, for aplastic anemia, which is rare, and also for hyponatremia. It's a P450 inducer, so you got to get, you can't have somebody on like heart and carbamazepine. You can't have somebody on chemo and carbamazepine. And you know, we got to give our patients like a chance. So we can't have a medicine that's going to eat their other medicines that they're on for a very important reason. And there's enough choices right now. Clobazam, the other word for that is Onfi. It was FDA approved in this country for 2013. We have international experience since the 1980s. It works for every single epilepsy type that there is. It's also a good anxiolytic. It makes people a little drowsy, and it was given for Lennox Gesto. So in the clinical trial, there was like a lot of um, kids that had this horrible epilepsy and are really impaired being given it. You give it to them, they get a little more drooly, they got more pneumonia. Clonazepam is not a great medicine for epilepsy, really, but um, we use it sometimes for a rescue. Eslacarbazepine is once daily dosing. It's the newer generation carbamazepine, and it's quite, it's quite easy to use. And we don't think you need to monitor for it. Um, Ethosuximide is only for absence seizures. Felbamate, you need to monitor this one like stink because at any point in the course, it can cause aplastic anemia. It also causes weight loss, and it's also a fantastic drug, so sometimes I do go to it. I love lamotrigine. Um, it, it, the problem with lamotrigine is you have to start it at a low dose, and you risk the rash, and then you can also have this very, very rare um, uh, inflammation that is extremely rare that can cause a high fever. So, and you can't start it when you, you can't start it right away because it takes six weeks to get to good dose because you started at such low levels. But it's just, um, it makes people feel well and it makes them feel like they have energy and it's an antidepressant. It's a mood stabilizer, but no one would give it for mania. It's not gonna help anyone with mania, but it's gonna help with that low, low de depression. It really helps. 
Levetiracetam, who here has ever heard of Levetiracetam? Who here has ever given it? It's the easiest medicine to give. It's like you give it and they're protected in like two seconds. Why don't I love this medicine? Anybody? Yeah, and those mood changes are real. I mean, we all went into this for one reason, and that's to make people's lives better. You know, taking away their seizures is great, and that does improve quality of life. But if somebody is having low-grade irritability every day for something that might happen once a month, I don't know that I'm like, you know, I don't know that's going to help me get into the gates of heaven at the end of the day. And people don't always, I mean, you guys know this better than anybody. People don't necessarily tell you that they're feeling crappy. And with levetiracetam, they don't necessarily experience it as a medication side effect. They experience it as their life being worse, as their partner being more annoying, as their children being out of control. So you really have to dig. And if there's, and if they, they may have had depression for 20 years before you put them on Keppra and they don't think it's any worse, I still would move them off of it. I'm like, I'm not into, I'm not into people feeling badly. But it's super easy to use and it has no drug interactions. Some of you here may think that it caused thrombocytopenia and it, I suppose that it does, but I've never actually seen it in the outpatient setting. It's always somebody's platelets are light, but it, it did in the clinical trial cause some thrombocytopenia, but in my practice, I have never seen it and I've taken care of a, a lot of people. Um, it's in the people that are very sick in the hospital that have thrombocytopenia and I'm, I'm, I've never been very convinced. Oxcarbazepine, um, you have to monitor for hyponatremia, which is, uh, it causes SIADH. It's much less likely to cause aplastic anemia. It is uh, much less, it is a weak P450 inhibitor and an inducer depending on the particular enzyme. Parampanol is a new medicine that causes mood irritability. Uh, phenytoin, I think you guys know about. Tobamax is great for migraine, but you do need to check the basic metabolic because it can cause a metabolic acidosis. And watch out for it with um, metformin because that can really cause a metabolic acidosis. It can also cause acute angle glaucoma. So your patient calls you and says, my eye hurts and they're on Topamax and it's not like go to bed and let's see what's going on. It's like, let's get you looked at today. Valproic acid is the most teratogenic medicine of all of the medicines. So you, any, any woman, you should not have them on this medicine. It can also cause weight gain. But for some, for some people, it's really hard to get them off of it. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay, we're going to talk about it right now. Uh, all right, so Miss Guy is 37 years old, and she has juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. So that just starts juvenile, but it stays with you until you, you until you die. You need a low dose. You need some medication for that. She's been on Depakote ER 1,000 milligrams every night since she was 12 years old. She tried to lower her medication at the age of 25, and then at 30, and she had generalized tonic-clonic convulsions. She's not had a seizure for seven years. She comes to your office excited, as she just found out she's pregnant. She estimates that she is 11 weeks pregnant. She has an appointment with her neurologist in three weeks and her OBGYN in two weeks. You'd lower her Depakote ER to 700 milligrams. You stop the Depakote and you start Keppra 1000 BID, or you make no changes to her medication. Who's for A? Who's for B? Who's for C? Okay, so the right answer here is actually C. Um, when somebody is pregnant, so first of all, they're already almost done with their first trimester, which is when most of the teratogenic effects will have taken place. It is a very dodgy business to change medicines in pregnancy. So you really, it's unclear what benefit you, you would get by putting them on, her on Keppra right now, and you do risk a seizure. So this is why it's not so hard to know the information that Depakote can cause teratogenesis. What's actually harder for us as practitioners is to ask people if they're having sex and to ask what they would do if they were pregnant and to ask what they would do if they started to have sex between your next visit and to kind of make sure they're on folic acid. These are really important conversations to have. And I really encourage you to think about this also in your people with intellectual disability and developmental delay um, because these people can be sexually active and can end up in your office um, pregnant. So this is like quite hard. This is from a 2012 paper from some really good data. This is and this is a slide that I encourage you to kind of keep for yourselves. Um, these are the rate of malformations um, and, uh, of all of the various medicines. So for lamotrigine, it was two. Lamotrigine is the safest in a lot of pregnancy registries. Lamotrigine is the same as the general population. And valproic acid is um, a 9% risk of malformations. And if you get valproic acid with, um, in combination with another medication, it can go up to 16%. So it is by far and away the most teratogenic. Um, 
Tegretol, carbamazepine, is one of the safest. I'm just telling you that because you might have learned that it's one of the least safe. And that was from old data that wasn't perspective. It is one of the safest. The lower the dose, the less teratogenic for all medications. So you want to keep the dose as low as possible. So even for valproic acid, when you're less than 700 milligrams, you're starting to get at like a 5% rate of malformations, much, much, much better. Um, uncontrolled seizures in pregnancy are not good for the baby either, and they're not good for the mom, and we're really here to take care of people. So this woman really would be at risk for a generalized tonic-clonic convulsion should you switch medicines. But it's very tough. It's very like risk and benefits um, assessment. Do have your people on folic acid. It's been shown to be associated with higher IQ, and I would have any woman with epilepsy um, on a milligram of folic acid a day. And in my experience, in my practice, people do not plan pregnancies. I mean, these pregnancies happen. I, I, I would say maybe 50% of my patients plan pregnancies and 50% are unplanned. But I feel like that it is my responsibility to make sure that we don't get an unplanned pregnancy on medicines that are totally um, uh, not going to be good for the developing fetus. And then the other thing that I think is a little tricky is I always want to make sure that when I'm talking to people about it, I'm not pushing pregnancy. And if they get pregnant and they want to have an abortion or whatever, like that's all their decision I'm here to support. But I do need to talk about it with people. Um, in, addition to, in addition to causing malformations, valproic acid is the most likely to cause developmental delay in a lower IQ. So in all ways, and women should really not be on valproic acid. That said, sometimes it is really hard to get them off because it it's a, works very well. Okay. <clears throat> oh my God, yes, yes. No, that's such a good question. So, um, so no, you know why? Because somebody actually wrote a paper about this because there, it was shown that carbamazepine was really safe in pregnancy and valproic acid wasn't around the same time. So we had people switching them to carbamazepine. But carbamazepine is only for focal epilepsy, and valproic acid is for focal and generalized onset. So we had all of these people with juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, which was a idiopathic generalized epilepsy, getting changed to carbamazepine, which actually makes their type of epilepsy worse. So lamotrigine would be a good choice because it's broad spectrum. There's a handful of medicines that just treat focal seizures, and they won't treat seizures that start everywhere in the brain at once. Like carbamazepine does treat seizures that start focal and then go to bilateral tonic-clonic, but if it starts generalized, it's not good at that. So it's bad for juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. <clears throat> yes, but it takes a long time and it's a, it's a hassle. But yeah, I mean, also lacosamide is a great medicine, um, but we don't have good pregnancy data yet for lacosamide. Um, but lamotrigine, sometimes you don't have, you have somebody that's not going to be able to follow with that titration schedule. Do you guys ever have trouble with people taking their medicines? Sure you don't. I'm sure that's easy for you guys. It's hard for me. Okay. Last case, a 26-year-old man with type 1 diabetes who developed sinusitis, a right frontal abscess, and a frontal infarct at the age of 17. Um, he had to have surgical debridement, and then he developed epilepsy um, at two years later. And he came to me and he was having, um, he had just gotten married and he had been, he had uh, generalized tonic-clonic seizures maybe like once a month. And he was actually <laughs> like handing out chocolates at his wedding when he um, began to have like a head turn like this, which is the sign that you're going to have a generalized tonic-clonic convulsion. And his dad got the chocolates like away from him and then managed to get behind him and like catch him. And he fell at his own wedding reception and then he had to go to like the bridal suite and like just like chill out. In addition, he was often feeling very, very, um, uh, like, uh, very, very fuzzy and unwell. And when we monitored him when he was feeling fuzzy and unwell, we didn't see anything on the EEG. He was on three medicine and he continued to have seizures. So this is, you know, I, we're here for all patients, but we're really here for the patients that other people are having trouble controlling. Um, about 30% of people are refractory to medication. If you're refractory to one well-chosen medicine, so if you're refractory to valproic acid and you have juvenile myoclonic epilepsy or you're refractory to carbamazepine and you have focal epilepsy, um, you're very likely to be refractory to all of them, which is very interesting because they have wildly different mechanisms of action. So there's something different about that refractory brain. 
So we really move towards lots of different types of treatment. So there's surgical and there's neuromodulation. You also want to think about ketogenic diet and canip, uh, treatment with um, cannabidiol. Like you want to kind of pull out all of the stops. So for this guy, I don't know why I don't just give up. So, so this is him and his uh, frontal abscess. So, so this is where his um, where he had the debridement, um, and it, that's on the right side of his brain. But when we did the EEG, it looked like all the seizures were coming from the left. And clinically, it looked like the seizure was coming from the left because his head would go to the right, which means that the seizure is coming from the left. And electrographically, it means it was going to come from the um, left. So uh, Columbia had evaluated him and didn't want to do anything. But we were, and this happens not infrequently in epilepsy, um, when you look at this, do you think his seizures are coming from here? This is the left side of the brain. Um, I'm going to tell you that they're not, that, they're, that this, this is so epileptogenic, this old, because seizures are in general um, coming from the cortex of the brain. So they're the, these old islands of disease looking cortex that's so epileptogenic. So this is really just like, this is like the serial killer that's walking around with like blood on his hands having just like trying to destroy my patient's life. And he's somehow or other managing to leave all the clues over here, even though this guy is like fine. This guy's not a serial killer and doing fine. And one of the things that happens, and I think you can imagine this, is that if you're having a seizure coming from here, you may not be able to see it as well on this side because there's less brain there. And also it may not be able to transmit it as well. So what actually happens is that the seizure activity starts here but spreads here. And then it looks like a seizure that's coming from here, but it's not, it started here. So when we put, we put electrodes in his brain, we do that by putting little holes in the skull and putting little electrodes in and to really help us figure out where seizures are coming from. And then once we figure that out, we can decide if we can take that out. But when we did that, we found that this area was always seizing all the time. And that's why he was feeling so fuzzy. Um, and we couldn't see it on the surface because it was just too small. Um, and we were able to debride this area. And this is his one-year seizure-free cake, his two-year seizure-free cake. He since had a baby. He finished um, his degree in education. He just got a job doing, like, education and theater with kids. I mean, he's, like, a totally wonderful guy. And he's completely seizure-free. So um, what? Yes. Yep, Exactly. I don't, I don't, I try and get people down very slowly to one medicine, but if they're feeling well, I'm not like no change for six months, definitely. Um, but there's a lot of different, um, there's different options for surgery. One is resective surgery. One is laser ablation for a laser ablation. We actually go in into the MRI suite. We put a wire into their hip, into their hippocampus. I don't know why I think this is going to work. We put a wire into their hippocampus and then we heat it in the MRI suite and we ablate it. And it's really nice for like the hippocampus because it's so deep. So you can get into it very well without cutting through tissue that might be. So this is the hippocampus. This tissue might be healthy, but this is a way to get right into it. And it, it, it causes less cognitive problems after surgery. Um, although really uh, temporal lobectomy causes minimal cognitive problems but it's less effective, it's slightly less effective, but a lot of people would rather have this. But the, the data for surgery is, if you take people with temporal lobe epilepsy and they're refractory to medication and I don't do surgery, guess what percentage of them will be seizure free? And you're with like an expert, somebody that does this all day long, like maybe eight, eight percent of those patients. And if I do surgery, 60% will be seizure free and quality of life goes up for those that are seizure free. And that was like, it's like one of the only randomized control trials in neurosurgery. So there's really good data for epilepsy. So I think we suffer in epilepsy from low expectations. It's like your, you know, your best girlfriend who keeps dating like terrible men. <laughs> like it's not okay to have one or two big seizures a month. We want to raise expectations for people. And I'm really interested in people, the lives people are leading. Like, are they, you know, going back to school? Are they pursuing their hobbies? Are they having, you know, relationships with others? Are they isolating? Are they getting out? Are they doing their own shopping? Are they learning to cook a new recipe? Are they living? And I feel like really using more techniques and really trying to um, kind of push the envelope a little bit is really helpful to the patients. 
Um, sometimes we can't make people seizure free, but we can make it much, much better. And I would really encourage you guys to refer people to our center that are having seizures that are not like that are not seizure free or that are maybe going to get pregnant or any kind of issue that could benefit from greater discussion. And also we're trying to use more peer to peer support because I think that that's really important also. We also do neuromodulation where we put a device in the brain that senses a seizure and defibrillates that and they live with that and that, that we're doing that more and more um, and we're one of the busiest centers for that. Yeah. What's involved in surgery? You know, it depends on where the seizures are coming from, from the patient, but it's an extremely long, like it, it's, it's a very, very, very meticulous and careful process. So someone needs to get an MRI, they need to have a consult. Uh, they usually need an admission for EEG where I look at their seizures. We have a big multidisciplinary conference where we talk about if they're a good candidate. After that, they sit down with their epilepsy doctor and the neurosurgeon, and we have a long conference with, and the family, and then we often need to do, we often need more information. So we put electrodes in intracranially and they have their seizures with electrodes intracranially and they're in the hospital for a week for that. And then we often brain map. So let's say your seizures look like they're coming from your language area. I will find out exactly through brain mapping. So I'll stimulate that area where language is for you and where your seizures are so that we don't take out, that we don't do any harm. That's really important. And then we decide if it's gonna be reception, laser ablation, neuromodulation or not or or that we can't do anything and we try to keep people informed um, every step of the way so it's very involved it's elective brain surgery so we take it there's no rush like nothing will be happen, nothing good will happen for rushing we really want to be there for people to like work through um, all their questions um, this is the team of people that I work with this is Madeline Fields the other co-director um, all of these people are like completely fantastic. They're sprawled out across the city. So if you have somebody that lives near Union Square, we have a doctor for that. And um, my feeling is that we really want to commit to decreasing the suffering caused by epilepsy by any means necessary. So that's medication, that's ketogenic diet, that's medical marijuana, that's epilepsy surgery, that's increased support, that's a psychiatric evaluation, that's counseling, that's a good primary care doctor like whatever, whatever it takes. I mean, there's really only one reason why we all do the work that we do, and that's to help people live better lives, and that's what we're trying to do at the Epilepsy Center. What other questions do you guys have? Yeah. You mentioned something earlier that talked about behavioral lifestyle modification. Just mentioned something yeah, diet. yeah. So we do have a ketogenic diet program and a dietitian. So ketogenic diet works. It really helps decrease seizure frequency. It is a... Um, it's, it's done in ratios, and the higher ratio, the more severe the diet is. So let's say you're on a two to one ratio, that means you have two parts um, fat for every one part carbohydrate and protein. So it's a very high fat diet, and you have to weigh everything with a scale, and you have to be in ketosis, and it really works. Um, the more liberalized version is the modified Atkins, which is also incredibly low in carbohydrates, but you don't have to weigh things, and it's much higher in protein. Um, the problem is those diets are really hard. Um, it's really hard to be on the ketogenic diet, um, but it can help. Um, and you need support. And sometimes we admit people to start the diet because people feel nauseous and they throw up and they don't really realize. It helps to teach them how to make how to make the foods, how to prepare them. Um, lifestyle modifications. It many people really need like nighttime sleep and less kind of stress and sleep and not to be binge drinking. Um, so basically like everything any person on this planet needs to like actually feel well, epilepsy patients need times two or three. So some people really know when they're gonna have a seizure because they've just pushed themselves too far. Um, so we really do work a lot with people and different people have different triggers. They know what's <laughs> right for them. And complementary techniques, there's none that are really proven. But again, people kind of know what they gravitate towards. So if somebody's like, I've always been interested in Tai Chi, I'm like, you have to take Tai Chi. Like you have to learn Tai Chi. You have to really take it, you have to become a student of Tai Chi and then you know, see if that works out for them. But I think um, things that sort of increase your parasympathetic nervous system, your ability to relax are really, really important. And I think in this culture, we all kind of walk around like this. And then we try to like relax by people have a drink or they watch TV and like we need, 
it's really good to help people figure out some other techniques. Yeah. No. Does he have seizures? He does now. He basically has a dramatic. He got the class, started taking medicine, he got punched out, and now has like seizures. So I would do, um, you could first of all do Lamotrigine. Um, and then I would just I would just tell them that it probably helps with seizures, SSRIs. So depression is an independent risk factor for the development of epilepsy. It's an independent risk factor for the development of epilepsy. It is nothing to be ignored. It is absolutely crucial for his well-being that he take an antidepressant. That he try. It may not work. I mean, they don't always work, but it's worth trying. The only one I would avoid is Wellbutrin at a, a dose greater than 150. Yeah. Okay, I don't believe in a low-fat diet, but that's another. <laughs> that's a discussion for. Then maybe you guys can counsel me on that. But um, absolutely not. A ketogenic diet, you have to be all in. You have to be a hundred percent committed. You have to have your game face on. It is a treatment. It is a small percentage of my population that I would do that to. Yeah, no, and they you'll see something from Abigail Rappaport who runs the ketogenic diet program. I would not put somebody, and it absolutely does raise cholesterol further. Um, yeah, absolutely not. So you don't have to worry that we're going to, like, willy-nilly put people on the ketogenic diet. Your diabetic patients with hypertension, they're not necessarily going to end up on the ketogenic diet. You know somebody needs a clonazole or another drug for you know, it it might be nice to get them off. Yeah, so you might need to lower their you might might need to lower their anti seizure medicine, which is rough because then they might have a seizure. It's nice to get people off the medications that have a zillion interactions and get them on levetiracetam or lecosidamide or lamotrigine or medicines that are easier for you to work with. But if you need to, just send them to their epilepsy doctor and just. You know, if you're on, if they're on, uh, the reason why um, this case was a was a good one because she was on it for a few weeks. You'll get away with a few days without totally destabilizing them, but a few weeks and you're going to run into trouble. And we we run into it when we have. If you're on Depakote and you start Lamictal, you have to start the teensiest dose of Lamictal because it raises the level. And then sometimes if you stop one seizure medicine, they'll get toxic on the other seizure medicine because it's pressing it. I mean, it's it just it takes a lot of mindfulness about it. But sometimes you are going to have to give that medicine, you know, ketoconazole or whatever. Anything else? Okay, great. Have a great day.